What a vision of loneliness and riot the thought of Margaret Cavendish brings to mind. It was in Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own that writer Danielle Dudden first encountered Margaret Cavendish. And she describes her as being like a carnation. I think, no, a cucumber, that's it. That's what's so important. As if some giant cucumber had spread itself all over the roses and carnations in the garden and choked them to death. It was such a bizarre and honestly kind of weirdly phallic description of Cavendish. Years later, Dunn started her PhD and took a class on the poetics and historiography of the 17th century. She got really into 17th century gardens. But everything Dunn wrote kept leading her back to Margaret Cavendish, the Duchess of Newcastle and a prolific 17th century writer. Like, she was in every garden I was writing about. So Dunn spent about 10 years writing a novel about Cavendish called Margaret I, A Novel. The book is fiction, drawn from Cavendish's real life. All the excerpts you're going to hear are from Dunn's book, like this one. For all these fertile inner workings, Margaret was thought plain, couldn't wear yellow, was shy. Yes, seemed younger than her years. Yet Margaret longed for fame. When grown, she would adorn herself like a peacock. She wrote that stuff about, on the one hand, desiring ambition and fame, and on the other hand, feeling like they were meaningless. You know, she struggled with that desire, I think. And she was notorious in her own era. These were interesting times. The King of England was convicted of treason. Then the King of England was dead. It was Tuesday. It was 1649. While in France, Margaret met William Cavendish, athlete, scholar, and the first Duke of Newcastle. The pair wed in 1645 while in exile in Paris. And while Cavendish had little formal education, she read and read and wrote and wrote. She even wrote her husband's biography. Cavendish loved philosophy. Dunn was intrigued by her thoughts on the French philosopher Descartes. He thought the universe was like a machine, the body like a clock. He'd once nailed his wife's poodle to a board. He believed nothing could think or feel but man. But how could he know a poodle didn't feel? Or even a magnet? A vase? Now he was gone and I ate my bread. While one book in the world might be considered an anomaly, two books, it seemed, sounded an alarm. The lady is a fraud. Even if the books were ridiculous, how could a woman speak the language of philosophy at all? Defending a second book quickly led to a third, Philosophical and Physical Opinions, 1655. In it, I argued all matter can think. A woman, a river, a bird. There is no creature or part of nature without innate sense and reason, I wrote, for observe the way a crystal spreads or how a flower makes way for its seed. I shared each page with William, often before the ink had dried. It put me at odds, he explained, with the prevailing thought of the day. How could the world be wound up like a clock, the fictional Cavendish wonders, pulsing, contracting, attracting, and generating infinite forms of knowledge? In 1666, Cavendish published The Blazing World, about a utopian kingdom in another world that could be reached through the North Pole. The blazing world with its blazing sky and river of liquid crystal, its gowns of alien starstone, its talking bears and spiders. William has told her it's her finest work, and even composed a poem to include. You conquer death in a perpetual life, and make me famous too in such a wife. The next year, Margaret became the first woman to attend a meeting at the Royal Society of London, a feat not repeated for centuries. And then when she got there, she basically didn't say anything. She'd arrive 20 minutes late, so she sits there still. Hook has finished and the room awaits her reply. But the Duchess only sits, looking into the device. That hat is too much, Peeps thinks. Still, her shape is fine. At last, she lifts her head. What ingenious remark will she make? Gentlemen, she says. I am all admiration. She rises from her chair. I am all admiration, she says again. She nods stiffly, as if wishing them well. She looks to Lord Bronker, who stands, surprised, and leads her to the door. People called her Mad Madge, but Danielle Dudden wrote her novel with a lot of love and respect for Cavendish. Margaret wanted the whole house to move three feet to the left. It was indescribable what she wanted. She was restless. She wanted to work. She wanted to be 30 people. 
She wanted to wear a cap of pearls and a coat of bright blue diamonds. Cavendish wanted to live in many ages and in many brains, and would likely get a kick out of being resurrected, in fiction and on the radio. For Philosophy Talk, I'm Holly J. McDeed.